My name is Yi Feng, Chair of the Department of International Studies at CGU. Uh, I hope that uh, you have some opportunities to take a look at the video clips that uh, we recorded from the last International Studies Student Research Conference. Uh, this is not the first time I saw them, but whenever I look at them, I have a feeling of such a profound pride. In the pictures, I see students and the faculty of different colors, different origins of countries, different cultures, different religions, converging toward one location, CGU. That makes me so proud of this university as a community. And we are here for one common purpose, seeking truth, pursuing knowledge, and bettering ourselves. And today we are witnessing and celebrating a landmark event, a great moment in the history of our university, the establishment of the Modernado Institute for International Security and Global Leadership. To make any institution great and sustainable, two elements are required, two basic necessary conditions, ideas and resources. Sometimes ideas and resources come separately. Sometimes ideas and resources come jointly. In the case of the Institute, ideas and resources arrived simultaneously. It was about this time last year, after we had our first very successful student research conference, we had a reception where we announced the best student research paper. And at that moment, I asked Ernie to share a few words with us. And everybody was moved. And I was deeply touched, as all my other colleagues. And this is how Ernie began his speech. This is what Ernie said. I'm quoting exactly. After so many years at CGU, I have finally, I have finally found my home. I have finally found my home. And this is in front of the faculty and the students. And we were all, all touched by uh, his very kind remarks. And at that time, I did not fully grasp the entire extent of the significance of those words until nine months later in December when Ernie initiated the idea of an endowed institute. And he has written the mission statement for the institute. That is, the institute should excel in apolitical and unbiased research that focuses on major international relations, international security, and international cooperation. The second point in the mission statement is we must produce value and utilities from our work. And finally, the institute must gain international recognition to the institute and to the university. So there are three points in that mission statement. And the institute is going to launch a series of activities, including the establishment of distinguished speakers, conducting research projects, and organizing research workshops. And we are also going to create uh, fellowship opportunities for our students so that our students can work with the faculty and to have opportunities to publish with faculty. And also, we will provide uh, travel allowances for our students to attend various conferences so such that they will become visible and competitive in the job market. And also, we'll make a connection with our sister research institutions across the country and in the world. And the institute does not belong to one department. It belongs to our academic community. And Ernie has already talked with me about expanding our collaboration within CGU and outside CGU. And I'm glad Andy is here today. And Andy and I will meet on some 
interrelated activities in the area of transdisciplinary uh, research and teaching. Uh, all this would have been impossible without Ernie's generous support and his vision and his resolution to make CGU a truly leader in higher education, an example, not to universities in the United States, but to our counterparts in other countries as well. And Ernie, may I ask you to stand up so that we all can recognize you and thank you. Would you please stand up? Uh, next, I would like to thank President Jessup, Purple's Eastern, Dean Bly. I know you are very, very busy. And uh, within, uh, I think, 30 minutes after I sent out the email requesting if you could participate with us for this very important event, I got responses from your staff. Almost immediately, real time, you will be all here. And uh, we thank you for your leadership and your important and great work makes it possible for our faculty to focus on our work, our primary responsibilities, that is teaching, research, and the training our students. And we thank your vision, we thank uh, the action you have taken to take CGO to a higher level. Through various stages of the planning for the Institute, we have received your very strong support and thank you, and we're going to hear from you shortly. And finally, I would like to thank you, the faculty and the students. The university exists because of you. And in a few years, the CGU is going to be 100 years old, in the year 2024. Compared to our counterparts in Europe, Grand Bird would know, we are still young. Many of our European counterparts are more than 1,000 years old. Uh, however, there are two things that are forever young. If I could form a novel about uh, a very famous university on the East Coast, that's Harvard. And this is something was raised so many times in that novel, which is there are two things that are forever young, youth and the pursuit of knowledge. So colleagues and students, let's be brave and free. Let's keep our vitality. And later I'm going to introduce uh, four panelists together with the moderator for the event. And this is to me a leadership, a star panel to discuss the two related important issues. But we can wait on that. And now I would like to ask President Jisa to share with us a few remarks. Thank you, President. Well, you thank you. It's just a pleasure and an honor to be here today celebrating this great occasion. Uh, you know, Ernie has meant so much to this university for such a, such a long time, Ernie and his family. Uh, he's been a model uh, of what it means to be a great steward uh, of a great university, uh, not only uh, serving uh, on the advisory board for in uh, the Division of Politics and Economics, but also a long time trustee uh, and board member for the university as well, and just now moving into emeritus status. And then in addition to all those sort of formal committee and board assignments, he's just always here. Ernie is sort of like the, the face of the university, certainly from our board's uh, perspective. He's always here for, for important events, and it means a lot to us to have you here and uh, have, you, have you nearby, close at hand. Uh, and then, you know, in addition, has been an incredible investor in what's going on at this university in a number of ways. Of course, uh, the, uh, with the, uh, the, the, the leadership fund that you've created with your wife, Mary, and then now, of course, the Maldonado Institute. Uh, so, you know, you need the old saying, time, treasure, and talent, and you and your family have certainly been doing all of that uh, for CGU, and we're deeply appreciative of it. And the other thing I would say, just to, to, to wrap up, uh, and, and I don't want to go on here, uh, but we're trying to move the university forward to be even more connected uh, with, you know, outside the university, looking for ways to partner with other great universities and other, and other organizations. 
um, and also to make a difference in the world, even more than we, we have been in the past. And I, I can't think of anything we're doing that'll do both of those th things more than what we're doing now. You mentioned it, Yi, with the, you know, and then Ernie asking you to, to kind of leverage this institute to start to do work with other organizations and other universities around the world. That's perfect. That's exactly where we need to be going as a university. We do a lot of it now. I'm seeing several of our faculty members now who do things internationally uh, and around the country, and I think this is gonna add to that. Uh, that being externally facing, looking for those great partnerships that'll have great impact, and hey, if it helps with enrollment, that's great. Uh, we're always looking for, for more uh, bright new students to come into the university. I think this institute is definitely gonna help with that, so it's very much in alignment with where the university's going. And then the other thing is just that it's, you know, one of the special things about this job, I always say to people, is to be to to work with people like Ernie and families like the Maldonado family, when when they're in their philanthropic moment. You you sort of think about you think about your life, and there are those few special moments you have throughout your life. The birth if if you're old like I am and you have kids, then the birth of your children is one of those special moments in your life. And there's usually about three or four of those moments in your life. And when you ask people to kind of go through and list those moments. Often for some that have the ability to do this, that one of those special moments is that philanthropic moment in their, in their life. That's one of the best parts about the job that we're in is to work with people like Ernie and to, be, and to have the privilege really to participate with them in that philanthropic moment. And I know from the emotion in your voice when you talk about this, what it means to you. And it's a privilege for us just to be able to do this with you. It's awesome. So Ernie, thank you so much for all you're doing for us and for, and he's already talking about what he wants to do next with me. So, uh, just, so you're, you're amazing. And we're really thankful to you and your family for all you're doing for us. Thanks. Next, I would like to ask our provost and executive vice president, Dr. Patricia Eason to share a few words with us. Well, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. It is a privilege and honor to be here uh, to really launch this exciting institute here at CGU. Um, you know, I was looking at the mission. I'm the chief academic officer here, so I think about what is it doing for our university, for our academic programming, for our students, for our faculty. And I looked at its mission. It is to pursue apolitical and unbiased research focused on major issues related to international security as well as global leadership and cooperation. I noticed that Yi had memorized the mission. That's, that's a really good sign. Um, but I took out three values that stand out from this. Unbiased, international, global leadership, right? So Ernie, uh, some of you may know this, uh, Ernie spent his professional career in public service, really, including 10 years as an Air Force intelligence specialist and 30 years as a member of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. So you can see in, that, in those choices um, these three values coming in, in very interesting ways together. He actually served as a captain. I don't know for how many years you were the captain uh, of the Sheriff's Department. Five years as captain as well. He has served on Claremont Graduate University's Board of Trustees and also on the Board of Advisors at Pepperdine University. He has managed and befriended people from all walks of life. He listens, he considers, and he engages in meaningful dialogue. So the mission of this new institute strikes at the core of our academic mission. It is focused on complex, persisting, societal problems that we all care about. It requires a transdisciplinary approach. It draws on methods and ideas from many disciplines and many perspectives. And it highlights the importance of leadership for transformative uh, solutions. So Ernie, you are a true supporter of the pursuit of knowledge, of practical solutions, and actions that carry out those solutions. You've been a good friend to this university and to each day making this the best world we can. So thank you and your family for establishing this institute and for supporting the work of our students and faculty. We look forward to the work ahead.
Next, I would like to ask uh, Dean Michelle Bly to speak to us. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I have the honor and privilege of going after two of our amazing academic leaders who have already stolen a lot of my content. So uh, I just uh, want to briefly add a few remarks. Um, first of all, welcome uh, as Dean of the School of Social Science Policy and Evaluation. I invite you to enjoy the rest of your time here today with Triple SPE, as we like to call it for uh, shorthand. And I wanted to share a couple of, uh, of memories in honor of the inauguration of the Maldonado Institute. So I first met Ernie um, many years ago, actually, through our shared interests in teaching and developing leadership. And to be quite honest, I did not think uh, a captain of the sheriff's department who spent his career in part leading in the military and uh, police officers, and I would have much in common when we talked about leadership. After all, I lead faculty and students in an academic environment. But we had some great conversations, and I learned a lot from Ernie. Um, uh, just a few things I've learned that I would like to share with you. I, I've learned how to passionately support ideas that you care deeply about, and how to role model those values and beliefs in ways that others can easily see and follow, and how to keep approaching and pressing world problems with informed research and dialogue. And Ernie really epitomizes that leadership. He really walks the talk. And you've heard the vision for the Institute a few times. Uh, what I'd like to add is that although he specifically states in the vision that we are to excel in apolitical and unbiased research, he also walks that talk. And he specifically shares with me that he watches news from across the spectrum and seeks out diverse perspectives from people on all sides of the political aisle. And I really uh, tremendously uh, respect and, and honor that. So I, I feel that there's a perfect match between Ernie's vision and the strength and expertise of our amazing faculty, many of whom are here today and you'll be hearing from. And we are all really confident at Triple SPE that we'll be carrying out Ernie's vision effectively under Yee's leadership. So it's a true pleasure for me to be able to publicly thank Ernie for his ongoing mentorship for me as dean, as well as of the school, and his dedicated support for CGU. And I'm really looking forward to our breakfast in the future where we will be celebrating our many future successes in research that informs public policy, provides answers to some of the most pressing problems in society today, such as international conflict, homeland security, terrorism, geopolitics, and how we can develop and support effective leaders. So thank you, Ernie, for your ongoing friendship and support of the university, and for mo role modeling the many ways in which leadership for what, as Jean is constantly reminding us, truly matters to our students, our faculty, and our world. Thank you. Welcome home. Thank you, President Jessup. Thank you, Provost Eason, and thank you, Dean Bly. Thank you for your guidance, your leadership, and uh, we will follow up, and we'll make sure your expectation for us will never run short. And finally, I would like to ask Dr. Ernest Maldonado to come forward. Thank you. I have three things to share with you today. And one, first of all, I want to ad lib a little bit off my notes and say this is very humbling to hear all these accolades and uh, congratulations to me. Thank you very much. It's reciprocal. I really appreciate all of your efforts and your work here at CGU. The three things I have to share, first of all, is to express my thank yous in a little bit more detail. The second thing is to encourage you in this room to give back to CGU now and into the future. Then the last thing is my, about my, expect, expect, my expectations for the Maldonado Institute. My sincere thank you to my family, one member here today, Lisa. Okay. <laughs> my, my sincere thanks also to Len 
and to Patricia and to Michelle and to uh, all who have helped me in the creation of the Maldonado Institute. And of course, director of the new institute, uh, E. Feng. I've been giving back to, you heard a little bit about this, I've been giving back to CGU and I calculated it about, in money terms, about 25 years. And I was like, whoa, that's a, quite a while. Uh, 25 years, my sincere thank you to CGU for his superb education and a lo lifelong friendships with and support from faculty and staff who I meet with regularly now, and uh, both yesterday and today. One of the reasons, and I've talked about this before, that I came back and embraced CGU again is because of those personal relationships with prior faculty who now at my age, many of them are lo no longer here, regrettably. But uh, all the new newer ones, you young people, <laughs> You know, I've uh, made great friendship with you, and I really enjoy that. Uh, I hope all of you in this room feel uh, the same indebtedness that I do to CGU, whether you're administration, staff, uh, faculty, and current students and uh, former students. Finally, my vision for the Maldonado Institute. This is from me personally, uh, uh, is that student, C, CGU students and faculty working with the Maldonado Institute will get the support and be encouraged to do all that factual research with an apolitical and unbiased. And as you said, rightfully so, I do. I watch both sides of the TV channel and I hate one side and I kind of reluctantly accept what the other side saying, if you know what I mean. <laughs> You know, the MSNBC to, to Fox News kind of a thing. But uh, I think we all need to do that. We all need to step back and to look at different versions of the world around us and not just go, I had a, co a couple of comments when I listened to those research papers. And one, I made a comment to one person saying, you know, you're going about, you're talking about this particular topic and have you looked at the other side of it or are you going to report on that? And I sort of got, uh, mixed sort of sentiment, you know, and uh, we'll have to talk about that some more. When we all do research, even when I did it here as a PhD student, I remember being drawn into the focus. It was focus, focus, focus by my advisor right here, just focus. And I was thinking, I'm going down this road. What about everything else? You know, I think now in my later years. So that's very important that we do that. Both international security and global leadership are two obviously critically important topics when addressing the global uncertainties that we face here in the 21st century. Today we have crises in Venezuela, North Korea, across our southern border, and between India and Pakistan. I wasn't even aware of that because my wife said, well, you don't watch the BBC News. They have this conflict going on between, you know, between two nuclear powers. You know, how much more important is that in our world than two countries fighting over what's happening in Kazakhstan? And I'm just thinking, I bet you most of you, many of you don't know that. And if I, I used to, I used to do this in my classes as I conducted them, and I'll be brief, I'll try to be brief. But I used to say for things of the day that were occurring, how many of you are aware of this and this? And I'd get about two hands out of 30 people. And I go, don't you, how many of you read the paper or go on the internet, you know, look at news and so forth? And regrettably, not a lot of people do that, even college students. Studying here, studying the here and now to how we should best proceed is what I'm looking at for the Institute and for the university. You know, risk analysis, threat assessment, two areas that I worked with during my careers in the military and law enforcement. And the reason why I have created the Maldonado Institute with the new director is for us to look at those particular topics. And I, I, uh, we need to look at where we're at now and where we're going. Is, and I just thought of that from all my, my careers, both in the military and in, and in intelligence. That's exactly what you do. You analyze the here and now, and what does that mean to where you're going? A wise American said it best, if we could first know where we are and whither we are tending, we could better judge what to do and how to do it. Abraham Lincoln. So 
that kind of thought has gone even before him, I'm sure, from Plato, et cetera. But anyway, thank you all very much, and I look forward to your, your friendship and your support now and into the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ernie. Um, perhaps you have not known this. Uh, even before the institute was halfway through, Ernie already designed uh, some future work for us to follow up. Particularly, he came up with a list of uh, a dozen important issues for us to study. And uh, in the summer, we are going to focus on two projects. And this month, we are going to send out uh, some calls for ideas. And uh, we will start uh, working on those uh, two related projects. So watch out for email from us. And I think at this moment, uh, we will have a nice transition into the panel discussion. When the table or the podium is being set up, Gwen, where's the Gwen? <laughs> uh, yes, I would like to uh, uh, introduce to my best ability within such a short possible time uh, our panelists. We have uh, five faculty members who comprise, this is what I call star expert panel, a leadership panel, a world-class faculty panel. And to say world-class faculty to me is still an understatement because they are all true leaders. Uh, let me go one by one briefly because we don't have much time. Uh, our moderator today is Professor Mark Abdulhien, our full clinical professor at the Department of International Studies. And Mark is among the country's best practitioners using forecasting models, aging-based modeling, dynamic modeling, big data, to analyze very complex issues, not about international relations, but applicable to business, marketing, accounting, so on and so forth. And uh, Mark has excelled in training students for the public and the private sector, and also for his excellent service to this country through his leadership at a company where he is CEO. And Mark, is also a major contributor to a theory in international relations, the power transition theory. You may not have heard a lot Mark's name being connected to the theory, but I know for a fact Mark's contribution to that theory is fundamental. And I hope Professor Kugler agreed to that, even though I did not hear him ever give credit to Mark, but I know for a fact Mark has been contributed to that theory. And uh, uh, Professor Jean Liebman Blumen carries the Thornton F. Bradshaw Chair of Public Policy and Management at CGU. And she is also the director of the Collective Leadership Institute, an institute that has a great influence on academics and the practitioners. And uh, Jean has written many books and there's something about Jean I did not say to you ever in public and in private. But I hope today I'll have some opportunity to say this. And I want to thank you, Jean, for your years of mentorship, your books titled Allure of Toxic Leaders, How Do We Survive Them? And your book, Collective Leadership, have been my textbook. And uh, you and your work have provided uh, the ballast, the bedrock, and the foundation for my service to the university. And for that, I really want to thank you. And this is the first time I said it to you in private and in public. Thank you. And our next panelist, uh, to me, is a hero. Uh, she, she came from a different country. She represents diversity to the highest level. And her knowledge is so powerful. Uh, I look at her contribution to this university in terms of student mentoring, 
in terms of uh, research, in terms of student recruitment, in terms of a connection of CGU to the rest of the part. To me, I just cannot measure her contribution. Then that's the Dr. Salama Shaker. The former ambassador to Canada and uh, the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of G Egypt, she was the first woman who ever, ever held a Deputy Minister position in Egypt. And I want to thank her for years of uh, service to CGU, her support to the program in the, in the Department, of, Department of International Studies, and for her friendship. Uh, Patrick Jim, Dr. Patrick Jim, uh, sitting there. And Pat has been uh, with us for a number of uh, Tuesday talks, and I was still surprised he couldn't find a direction to CGU. I thought that you were now switching to us. You know, he asked me a question about the parking lot. He asked me about the building, the location. I thought you knew. And it seemed that uh, we need to uh, strengthen uh, the tie between the CGU and UIC more, so that next time I don't have you give you the direction about the parking. Uh, Patrick uh, is uh, uh, the Dorsey Dean Professor at UIC, where she, uh, he also is the Director of uh, International Relations. He has uh, held many illustrious leadership positions in our organization, International Studies. Currently, he is the president of International Study Association, the world's largest academic organization focusing on international relations and international affairs. He is the president. And, uh, and Patty, you did not know this. I have to share this with you. Back in February, the faculty of the International Study Department met, and we decided to invite one external speaker to join us for this very important event. And we uh, drafted a list of uh, a dozen candidates for the spot of an external speaker, the unique, the only one. And on the list, we have had a number of uh, chaired professors, leading scholars in this country. We had a director of a research institution in Europe, we had a former Secretary of State of the United States. We have a former Secretary of Defense of the United States. I presented this list to Ernie. I said, Ernie, help us make a choice. Within 24 hours, I think Ernie needed 24 hours because Ernie was a very careful person. I'm sure during the 24 hours, you Googled those 12 people and you study their background. And they're going to call me. I wanted Patrick James. So you were Ernie's number one choice. And we submitted list and ranked. I'm sorry. We did not put any rank. So you were not our number one, number two. But it's unranked. And Ernie selected you as the number one person to speak today. And uh, uh, finally, uh, we have uh, Professor Yasser Kugler. And Professor Yasser Kugler uh, doesn't need uh, introduction here. And uh, <laughs> he is our Elizabeth Rosenkranz Professor of International Relations. And uh, like uh, Patrick James, he has uh, held many positions in the profession. But he was best known as a co-founder of a major international relations theory named the Power Transition Theory. Unfortunately, that theory was largely ignored in practice, but not in academia, through most of uh, the last century, through most of the last part of the last century. And uh, people did not pay attention to this theory until recently. The theory now carry a lot of weight. The theory has gained currency increasingly from Washington DC to Beijing, from Brussels to New Delhi. And so the institute has a lot of work to do. And uh, well, we, I just talk about power transition. Patrick James is the current president of ISA. And uh, Professor Kugler is the past president of ISA. If I could coin a new usage of a word, I would have said 
Professor Kugler, you have been transitioned by Dr. James. <laughs> and I, I can speak much time to talk about my colleagues, but in the interest of time, I'd like to pass the podium to our moderator, Dr. Abdelhuyi. You're in charge. We should ask the uh, panelists to come sit down here. That would be fantastic. Uh, Pat, Yi, Salama, Jean, come join us down here. We have space for you guys down here. No, no, no just everyone can come sit. That think it'll be great. Yasek, are you going to come join us? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, well, uh, first of all, Ernie, thank you, sir. Uh, one, for your contributions to CGO over the years, uh, because you've consistently been there as a benefactor, as a, a leader uh, on, the, on the board, and, and really trying to see our vision. So it's a great opportunity for us to see. Um, well, and I, I'm really excited because I actually have the opportunity to moderate uh, some of my professors, which is a great thing. Um, so, you mean moderate <laughs> Yeah. Um, the other colleagues, uh, friends, as well as mentors. So it's a great, great honor for myself. Uh, so let's figure out, we're gonna um, do this, we have uh, two sets of questions. One, I think, for Pat and Jean, or uh, Salama and, and Pat. The other for Yasek and Jean. Um, first of all, Ernie, you make a great, you have a great vision and a great challenge for us. Um, and that is... Loaded questions. <laughs> <laughs> What does the 21st century hold for us in terms of international security? And how we can't take that same topic of the 20th century into the 21st century, because you're spot on. Um, so I think we'll uh, start off uh, uh, with Salama and Pat. And then uh, the second question we'll ask uh, both uh, Gene and Yasek is, what can or should the US do about it? So, um, Every time you turn on the news, there's some other international event going on. Uh, we had an unfortunate Easter bombing in Sri Lanka. We have the continuing crisis in Yemen, Venezuela, Syria, Libya, uh, most recently. Um, there's fake news. There's uh, seemingly interference in democratic processes around the world. Um, and we hear about, uh, you were talking, in, you ask a lot of your work in terms of peer competition between the United States, Russia, and China as we move ahead. Uh, so, two questions for Salama and Pat. 
and we'll give you a few minutes to answer them at, at your leisure. But number one, given your deep experience and your perspective, um, what do you think the major challenges are? And then number two, it, in order that for us to execute our new vision, uh, what sort of apolitical, unbiased work and research that you've been doing, and a lot of us know, um, is going to help achieve that vision. Salam. Thank you all, and indeed it is a great pleasure to be with all of you, and I would like very much to welcome you know, the future leaders of our world, and I would like to extend a very special note of thank you to Dr. Maldonado and to the Maldonado family for availing us, all of us, to be together in this very important opportunity as stakeholders of our world. I have to get started. <laughs> So, frankly speaking, the way that I would be addressing all these very complicated questions, I would say the fact of the matter is that the United Nations motto has a very clear vision for all of us. Leave no one behind. Having said that, Albert Einstein reminds us that peace cannot be kept by force. It can only be achieved by understanding. And indeed, peace is a never-ending process. So again, frankly speaking, if I'm going to be addressing the Middle East, and I'm proud to say that Claremont Graduate University has this wonderful statement now through a book that was co-authored by Steve Childs and myself together with CGU graduates. So the 17 chapters in the book have the statement of CGU, regional, and global rivalry in the Middle East. So having said that, indeed the Middle East is a volatile and turbulent major, I would say, uh, region in our whole world. And we cannot just put the Middle East aside when we are talking about peace. Having said that, it's very important, and I put that in context, actually, with the book which was written by Dr. Henry Kissinger. In fact, when he writes about world order and how world order faces the paradox, since its prosperity and sustainability is dependent on the success of managing global resources and the management of political processes which can be threatened by lack of good governance and lack of cooperation between not only Europe but regional partners wherever we are talking about how to address conflict. So all together, and when we are trying to visualize what I would describe as means of resolving some of the conflicts in the Middle East, the major player here will always be the United States of America. Yes, indeed, we all heard that the United States will be removing from Yemen, from Syria, its troops. Now, this has to be very much analyzed and understood in one major psychological factor that is impacting the American people the fatigue of war in both Afghanistan and in, as we all know, of course, in Iraq. So putting all that in perspective, I would like here to <coughs> underline the fact that two experts in the Middle East whom I met, and I really believe that whatever they say comes from the field experience, just like I would say it, you know, they always say, what happens in the Middle East doesn't stay in the Middle East. <laughs> and that is the true fact. Conflicts that are in the Middle East have their reverberations everywhere else in the world. So here, clearly, the Middle East matters because of geopolitical and geostrategical reasons. And of course, we have to realize that all what we are saying just like 
when we are talking. All this is actually put in substantive, uh, I would say, uh, uh, reports done by RAND Corporation. I had the opportunity of meeting some of the members of RAND Corporation. Be it here in the United in uh, Washington, I'm sorry, in Los Angeles or in Washington D.C. And here they put this in the report, which is titled "The Future Security Environment." And the most pressing issues that they are outlining, and in fact we did brainstorm together. <coughs> First, proxy conflicts in Yemen in Libya as well as in Syria, which caused power vacuums in the region that gave rise to, as we all know, of course, non-state actors, considering the fact that we are talking here about a Daesh that can be called ISIL, we're talking about Al-Qaeda, we're talking about Lebanese Hezbollah, which emerged and are really threatening the regional and global security. Another very important factor here is the oil price hike, which have and will have a negative impact on the economies of the world at large. Nuclear proliferation of arms. Fourth, Iran's nuclear and political ambitions in the region using sectarian and ethnic cards to inflame conflicts and proxy wars as we see in the case of Syria and Yemen and Libya. Again, the rivalry between Iran and Saudi Arabia and the fact that Turkey and Qatar are <coughs> both supporting militant groups and supporting, as we all know, the Muslim Brotherhood. Palestinian-Israeli conflict and the pressing need to find a resolution. The demographic explosion in the Middle East and lack of job opportunities and increasing disparities between the haves and the have-nots. The refugee crisis, which exceeded the regional boundaries with more than 13 million Syrian refugees and nearly 60 million displaced people since the Syrian civil war in spring of 2011. All this brings us actually to the major kind of focus that we need to be looking for. The fact that when the United States seem to be disinterested in the region, other powers are going in. And of course, we all know how China is indeed in the region with the One Belt Road Initiative. Having said that, Russia. Russia <coughs> is there, and indeed the military presence and the military base of Russia in Syria, you know, is a case that we all need to be following very carefully because Russia as well is building right now very close cooperation with Saudi Arabia. So when you think about partnerships and allies, we have to put everything in perspective. And here is the role of the United States as a leader that had really made major, and I mean major steps, to build peace after the peace uh, accords between Egypt and Israel in 1979, which is sustaining peace up till now. This could not have been the case if the United States was not really engaged in its role as a mediator. So altogether, when we look into terrorism and fighting terrorism, there needs to be very much a kind of cooperation. So altogether, as we are here now, as we all know, there are unrests in Algiers, in, uh, in Sudan, and this needs to be looked upon as possible major instability, again, sending tremors into the region. In conclusion, if I may say, with all the clouds looming in the Middle East, it is the right moment, and I'm using this because that's the way we teach our diplomats and our future leaders, all of you, when 
is the time when a power needs to be interfering and really mediating. Of course, we all know that when the United States can articulate a clear and realistic approach which requires constructive engagement with a vision of global and regional partnership based on geopolitical realities with inclusive global cooperation through the United Nations and Europe, Europe and regional partners to avert global anarchy and build peace based on justice. You are all the future leaders. And it is the time, the right moment, for us to understand the value of peace. We, in the Middle East, can appreciate it probably more than anybody, except, of course, for Europe. But the Europeans made partnerships together. And indeed, the fact that the United States fell in and was in the Middle East from the times of President Eisenhower and the partnership with President Clinton, and I'm making it you know, a point because I lived the times and I experienced it when President Clinton was in power with all the partnerships that was done with many of the Middle Eastern countries as well as many of the Asian countries. That was the time when we all said the glory of the United States of America with partnerships, not preaching, but partnership. The USA, you know, and here we have seven from Egypt. And this is what I call building bridges and bringing peace to our world because we all appreciate what peace is. It is a continuous process. Thank you, and I'm in for any questions. Time's up. <laughs> So, so Pat, why don't you get set up? Um, you know, Salama brings up, you know, given her real personal experience and, and her academic knowledge, some very important issues about cross-cutting cleavages, about proxy wars and having unintended effects um, that we witness here, right? So um, as you get that set up, I think Pat's going to um, show us. Um, but Salama, you know, one of your lenses is looking at the lack of governance, the lack of cooperation in these multilateral institutional frameworks really to take advantage or solve a lot of these challenges. Uh, now as we are speaking here, practically speaking, what is happening is that the United Nations through the Sustainable Development Goals is filling in what the American, uh, I would say, partnership is not able really to do considering the fact that economic assistance for Egypt dwindled down from one point billion, you know, when it was actually initiated by President uh, Carter and President Sadat, now it's just no more than two fifty hundred million dollars. So frankly speaking, when the United States is not the the global organizations fill in. Now the global organizations and the United Nations will never be able to fill in because if the United States as well does not pay its you know membership and all the financial support given to the United Nations then the UN cannot even do the proper role. So here again I go back to Dr. Kissinger's very basic assumption. The United States is needed worldwide to stop energy and to bring in what we described again in sustainable development goals as good governance, accountable leadership, and future leaders because they are, as they, meaning USA, invest in enhancing programs for career development. Seven will go back to Egypt and another seven cohort will come in. Before that, it used to be 5,000. And I lived these ages of different cooperation systems. So I, I think you've set a very high bar for Gene and Yasek uh, after we talked to Pat, right? So uh, Pat, give, give us your perspective, your optic, um, being you know, one of my heroes in IR, uh, as long as you know, 
you have a very unique view on this. And I think your view goes across all different sorts of human scales, from the macro to the micro to the kind of meso uh, infrastructure or institutional. So, um, how do you think, what are some of these challenges that we're facing in the 21st century that we really didn't face in the past? The, the bar has been set very high, a terrific speech. I'd like to begin by saying how honored I am. Uh, Dr. Maldonado, I cannot uh, even express in words properly how grateful and humbled I am. And thanks to all of you so, so much. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, and of course, to Ifang for his wonderful introduction. I feel absolutely no pr pressure to perform at all at this point. <laughs> so insecurity in the 21st century, is, as Mark set it up, I'm gonna talk about a set of things can't talk about everything, but what I'm going to do is introduce my thinking with The Tempest from Shakespeare. I'm going to talk about some of the challenges without as much attention, perhaps, to some that are very interesting and have been discussed already, but you can't talk about everything in 12 minutes. I'm going to talk about NATO, China, the Iran, Iran and Korean, North Korean situations together, and then Russia and the Arctic, and then I'll wrap up. Even though it wasn't assigned to me, I have one slide on what might we do anyway in light of these things? And it won't be about any one of them in particular, but a certain style to pursue in moving forward from the standpoint of the United States. So one of the most memorable phrases in this great play was the past as prologue. And that's the theme of my talk in the sense that, brace yourself, everybody except for Yi Fang, that's game theory. And while I am not going to explain anything that looks like that, my analysis is based upon the type of theorizing made so famous in a movie called A Beautiful Mind in the Light of John Nash, the Nobel Prize winner who won the prize uh, with two other scholars. The idea being that you can analyze problems using mathematics, but you also need inspiration as well, and that's where Shakespeare comes in. That's a game tree. I'm going to argue that in each of the cases, we're not just starting fresh. Things have happened, sometimes for decades, maybe even for centuries. So the past is prologue, starting with NATO. NATO, you might be surprised at me putting it up here when there are places that are on fire right now with an incredible amount of violence. I'm talking about the United States fraternity or sorority or wherever you want to call it. This is the US's major club in terms of security within the infrastructure of the United Nations. We have the Security Council, but the United States has its friends, its buddies, if you will, in NATO. And one of the things that we would say about it is that NATO burden sharing has not been proportional to size of country, not even close to it. The United States arguably, in terms of past as prologue, has socialized its allies into free riding, who's the villain, who's the hero here, not worth getting into. The fact of the matter is, for a long period of time, my, virtually all NATO members underprovide. There are only a few exceptions. So these are some older numbers that have actually got a little bit better. And you may be surprised about why and who I'm going to credit with this to some degree. So I'm here also to provoke and stimulate, following on from the excellent remarks earlier on. Here's a quotation from Donald Trump. One thing he does is he rattles the prologue and calls out the best friends of the United States. And this is a very risky thing to do, in that many were angry. I'm Canadian, by the way. There's Pierre Trudeau in the middle thinking really not very friendly thoughts right now, as Trump is announcing this in a way that is not, shall we say, particularly polite and collegial. What happened? In June of 2017, quietly, behind the scenes, Many of these countries, not radically so, but to some degree begin spending more per capita than they had been. So in this case, the past is prologue, was bad news, and Trump took a gamble jumping off the equilibrium path, as a game theorist would call it. And I'm gonna argue that on this one, I think he has it right. He doesn't always, by the way, that's not gonna be a theme here. Do not think that for a moment. What about China? I think this is not being done as well. The past as prologue is what is known as, if you know about this, raise your hand, the century of humiliation. Does anybody know what that, okay, a few hands are going up. This is not generally known in the United States. Show respect for China, 
as a mature great power, put italics on the word mature, in return for cooperation. What would be the superordinate goal for the United States and China in the security domain? The past and prologue does not prevent the one that I am going to argue in favor of, namely, and it's not getting done particularly well over time, denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and Japan and Taiwan. Why am I saying this? Why am I putting them together? These are exactly the kinds of things that can give us World War III in Asia. Very old picture from before World War II, conflict between Japan and China, a lot of rage to this day in China about it, and concerns about Japanese nuclearization are real. Here's Taiwan, if you can read the banner, Taiwan is not part of China, don't tell China that. It is not wise to push what was once called the quote unquote Taiwan lobby. Some people in the room remember what I'm talking about. Instead, try to get off the issue of independence versus incorporation and get into the issue of denuclearization. Okay, how about Iran and North Korea? I'm going to be tough on the deal that's in place. I am a critic. I do not like the Iran deal. And I'm going to tell you why, because there are two questions in terms of the past as prologue here. What else happened, and who else was watching when this was negotiated? So let me put up a cartoon. Hope it shows well in the back. You got the Iranians, you got the US Navy. Yes, that's crude and oversimplified. But this isn't really about Iran, where I think actually the deal has a fighting chance to do some good, and may even have done so already. Here's who I'm worried about. Who else was watching? Anybody recognize him? He's rather troublesome, and I think he wants to get paid, and I think he wants to be obeyed. Past his prologue here, you solve one problem, you may arguably, with what is known as the Hurdut Kingdom, have created more trouble in that game equilibrium I was talking about than you had before you started. My fifth section of the talk, one slide here, you have to squint to see the names. Not important to do so. It's Russia's militarization of the Arctic. You see all those names up there? All those bases? Is anybody else but Russia anywhere near this level of activity right now, including the United States and that club that it belongs to, NATO? Is anybody doing much of anything? Absolutely not. If you were going to call out Prime Minister Trudeau as one example of a leader of an Arctic power, you would do so perhaps most of all for falling down on the job here. Because, and I doubt this part will be controversial, the Russian regime is oligarchic, corrupt, declining, and arguably more dangerous and aggressive in its near abroad than the Soviet Union was. The reason is during the prime years of the Cold War, there was brinkmanship, but at the same time, there was no sense of doom on the part of the Soviet Union. Russia is a train wreck. They are constantly worried about defaulting on paying pensions. That's one thing that can actually limit what they do. But it doesn't mean that they won't be petulant and aggressive as climate change, which I don't have time to talk about, gives us more water up there that can be, if you will, a transmission belt for ships. How wonderful to trade more easily. Well, um, military ships can go up there too. And who's building bases? Like there's no tomorrow. All right, hope I'm not rushing too much and losing everybody. What to do, this is the next set of talks, but I wanted to talk about, go back to those slides at the beginning, past this prologue, and the game tree where the further down you go, your old decisions kind of limit what you can do. Kind of like somebody paddling downstream and they can't turn their canoe around very easily and go up. They're kind of forced to keep going to some degree in the same direction. I'm gonna argue that we should not be talking about identifying any kind of Trump doctrine, that we should not be trying to talk, identify any kind of anti-Trump doctrine. Instead, we should take a much more tactical point of view, like a game theorist playing each game individually, and to do that to overcome the constraints imposed by the past as prologue. Think about all the problems I'm talking about, and other ones, if we had more time, for instance, there would have been a climate change discussion there was obliquely and in a limited manner when I talk about Russia and the Arctic, because is the situation speeding up and getting more dangerous? 
course it is. Climate change is going on right here while I'm talking for these 12 minutes. Everything is getting more challenging and difficult up there. Focus on tactics rather than grand strategic statements of doctrine, and you will do better in the rapidly changing 21st century. Don't be afraid to activate dormant issues, to defy the past as prologue when it seems like the right idea. Here you heard me saying positive things, even though it rattled everybody at the time. Eventually, some US president had to become much more forceful and aggressive in order to reverse some of the effects of socialization that took place vis-a-vis -vis free riding on military spending. Furthermore, do not fear a rapid change in your position when it's called for. One thing we're very tough on our politicians about is when they say they change their mind, as in, well, I'm going to do something differently. Well, actually, I'd like to see a whole lot more of that, because anybody who says that they never change their mind has simply stopped thinking altogether. And if anybody is going to doggedly hold on to the positions they've had for a long time or pattern downward into in the face of the rapid change of the 21st century, I would see that as most unwise. Instead, focus on tactics, be flexible, activate dormant issues, don't be afraid to do things like that, and above all, be conscious of the fact that there's such a range of issues to deal with that you really need to be tactical because of that range. You cannot be strategic and have a doctrine like during the Cold War because there is not one overarching adversary and one single issue that is dominance in the international system. There is a chaotic and rapidly changing world with which to deal. And at that point, I'm done. Thank you for your patience. It's really interesting because um, both you and Salama bring up a lot of the same issues in terms of looking at the interests in terms of crisis breeds opportunity. Uh, there's an opportunity and we can be short-term tactics, we can get a win and we can kind of push it ahead. But conversely, at the same time, we have these institutional frameworks from the 20th century, NATO, the World Bank, et cetera, the Washington Consensus which just isn't getting us to where we need to go. And, and so I think that's going to be a perfect segue into Gene, you and Yasek, uh, because um, your guys' charge was, given that here are the big challenges that we're facing, uh, what, and I thought, I don't know, Ernie, if you crafted this statement, it was, it was pretty well crafted. Uh, what can or what should the U.S. do? Uh, in the future, and, and that's so important. Um, so a few weeks ago, I was at the World Bank uh, spring meetings. I was having dinner with a friend of mine, who's ex-minister in a foreign country. I was one of the senior advisors at the IFC, and we're talking about U.S. leadership. And after we got through half the jokes on you know, <laughs> what's going on, um, you know, he and I were discussing that right now is such a critical time for. Um, we have political divisiveness in the country, and it's completely apolitical, it's divided. Um, and what kind of challenges, and how does that make the United States leadership of the future? Um, certain, uncertain, and what do we do? So, uh, Gene, we turn over to you, given your experience and, and, and you deep knowledge. Um, what are some of the things that the U.S can do versus what we should do? Okay. Well, I'm going to change that question. <laughs> of course. Uh, from what can the U.S. do to what can the world do? Because the U.S. cannot, nor can any other nation, do it single-handed. Mm -hmm. It has to be a global approach. And I, I know that Michelle talked about the fact that I am known for asking the question, leadership for what? What's the purpose of leadership? And from my point of view, the, the purpose of leadership is to identify an ennobling vision, something that brings, that brings meaning to people's lives and transforms the world to be a better place. I don't think that's something that any one nation, no 
no matter how thoughtful, how powerful, how wealthy, can accomplish on its own. That is a global enterprise. And so I think that when I ask leadership for what, an answer by saying identifying an ennobling vision that can bring meaning to our lives and also transform the world and make it a better place, I think about global peace. And I think that global peace is such a transformative goal. And there are three stages of a transformative goal. First, it's, it appears to be an impossible dream, absolutely beyond our reach. <clears throat> Over time, it becomes an imperative demand. And I think that's where we are right now. And I hope that we will reach the third stage, which I call inevitable destiny, that that is where we are headed. And I know many of you will know the famous uh, Albert Einstein quote that he says, the world is in danger, not from people who are doing bad things to it, but from the people who stand, and the nations that stand by and do nothing. So complaining about it and saying, it isn't, you know, this isn't good enough and that's not good enough, that won't make it happen. And so one of the things that, that I've been thinking about in the last few years, and uh, I, I, you know, welcome, I beg your cooperation on this, uh, is a peace plan. A I call it a connected leadership strategy for global, in enduring and sustainable peace and equitable prosperity because I don't think that you can have peace if you have great inequities in prosperity across the globe. Um, and we have entered in recent years, and we're just at the beginning of the stage, an era that I call the connective era, um, an era in which we are, we are connected to everybody else, whether we want to be or not. Technology is pushing us in that direction. We cannot escape it. It will become more the case that we are interconnected. And we are connected to others who have very, very different agendas, often agendas that conflict with our own and with the other people they are connected to. So what kind of leaders do we need for this kind of an era? We need a very different kind of leader than we've had in the past. We've had leaders in the past who were very autocratic, who told us what to do when we were just supposed to be sheep and follow, and follow them. But connected leaders are different leaders. They look for that small area of mutuality between and among groups that think they have nothing in common and begin there to get those parties to work together. And maybe they'll only work together on that one issue at, for that moment. But in so doing, they'll recognize that they really can work together, that it's possible, and there may be other things that they can do. So diversity and and interdependence are a curious combination because they pull in opposite directions. Diversity talks about who am I? How am I different? How am I unique? How do I express myself and live up to myself? Okay? But interdependence talks about mutuality, of overlap, of how we have things in common. And they, it really talks about collaborating, about doing things together. Uh, so they're pulling in very different directions. And you need leaders who know how to deal with constituents, not followers, like John Gardner, whom some of you may remember. Uh, I hate the word followers. If you ever looked up the word follower in a dictionary, if you were five years old, you wouldn't want to be a follower. It, it's such a demeaning uh, description. But a constituent, and constituent, I thought, 
having been forced to take Latin for eight years, I thought I, I would know what constituent meant. Con means together, stituare, stituary means I thought to stand. No, I was right on the first part. Con means together. Stituary means to, co to establish. So if you co-establish something, if together you, can, you create this vision or this uh, plan, then you are equally responsible. You're not just a follower. As a constituent, you have an obligation, not simply a right, but an obligation to keep that leader's toes to the fire to make sure that that leader does not violate the vision that was initially established. Because too many leaders come in on a vision that seems you know, very uh, exciting and acceptable, and then we discover that it, they, there's a lot of slippage in that. So I have uh, tried to put together a plan it's a peace plan. It's a strategy, a global strategy. And the website is W, and I've given you the website because it's open source. I want people to criticize it, to make changes, to say, here's a better idea. It's a www.connectiveleadership.com forward slash peace forward slash. If you just get to connectiveleadership.com, up in, in, in right at the top over toward the right. And click on that and there's a place for you to make comments and to disagree. And that plan, it you know, a, a plan can't come from one person's head. It has to come from the understanding and the, uh, the experience of everybody who is involved. So this is both a principled and a pragmatic blueprint for rebuilding the world, for rebuilding global economies and uniting the world community. I'm pretty old, but I don't think I have ever seen the world this divided as, as it is now. And here in our own country, it is appalling, absolutely appalling, that we live the way we do, that we do not listen to one another. And we think we have all the right ideas. I don't think that peace plan has all the most brilliant ideas, but I'm asking <coughs> you to help to make it better. And there's a plan for every society. And incidentally, the question about what can the US do, it is, again, it isn't what can the US do. This plan is designed so that at a certain appointed hour, Every nation signs on to the, uh, to the proposals in this peace plan. And for one, uh, every nation will develop a Department of Peace. Costa Rica has had a Department of Peace for years. Uh, when I was first working on this, I thought, well, there are no new ideas in the world. Somebody else, I'm sure, thought of this long before I did. And of course, I went back and saw that Benjamin Rush, who is one of the founders of, you know, of this country, had, had written a whole proposal for a Department of Peace. He even designed a, a, a treaty room where nations would come together and sign treaties of peace. Okay, so it's an old idea. And it's, it's just, if, if the, the past is prologue, then maybe we should look back to some of the people who had ideas which we have ignored. So let me just, how many minutes do I have? Three? Two? 15 seconds. 15 seconds. <laughs> OK. Well, then I'll just tell you uh, one thing, or oh, maybe two little things. One, the idea that we would have a, uh, a Department of Peace, and where would that money come from? From the budgets of the Department of Defense. Right now, the U.S. alone spends 50, at latest count, something like 52 or 56 percent of its budget on the military. What percent do you think it spends on education from, you know, from, you know, elementary to graduate school? Any guesses? Six percent. 
Think about that. Think about that. So if you took even half of the money, half of the budget for the Department of Defense, and turned it into a Department of Peace, if you had a council that was made up of people from the, from the Department of Defense and the Department of Peace who would work together, report to the Vice President of the United States, and have ongoing meetings so that they got to understand what and how they needed to move forward. Uh, that, would, that would be at least one small step forward. And then at that same time that, that this goes into effect, the, Dep the Department of Defense contracts would all become nonprofit, and the Department of Peace would offer for-profit con contracts. Think about where Boeing and you know, all the other uh, military manufacturers would be lining up the first day that the Department of Peace opened up with its contracts that were at the for-profit rate. I don't think I have to elaborate on that one. One last thing, and, and there's a plan in, in that peace plan for every sector of society. Let me just say two seconds about uh, what universities can do. Uh, some of you know that I have been talking about a re this, trying to uh, engage students to demand of this university that we provide for them a required course on peace and make it a requirement for graduation so that the students impose this on the faculty, that you need to teach us this so that when we go out into the world as decision makers, every decision we make, we have to look through that lens of peace. And if I'm voting in, uh, in the Congress about going to war, another provision says that all of my children and grandchildren who are old enough have to volunteer for the, for the military and for the most dangerous duty. And I think that will make people think a little bit differently. That means we need a draft to reinstitute the draft where we equalize the chances of being called to war, not just the underclasses that go there and, and, and suffer. And the other thing that I would uh, like to suggest for universities is that we set every university, set up a center for reconciliation of seemingly intractable conflicts. So we would bring together, say, the Palestinians and the Israelis, and they would come and we would provide the place to live, to eat, uh, no media allowed, none whatsoever. And they, the parties have to agree to stay in those meetings until they come to, re to some resolution like the troubles in Northern Ireland. And then the people who were most responsible for working that one through, for helping that one move along, like George Mitchell, would come to the next group and act as the yeast for, for the loaf of bread and change the process incrementally as we went along. So my time is up. <laughs> uh, thank you, Gina. That was a really great thing. But I've already seen a lot of commonalities. You know, I was, I was first thinking about it, you know, sharing this thing, and people coming from different perspectives, different backgrounds, different objects. Um, number one is the changing dynamics of international relations, of nation states, of commerce, of politics. Uh, that's been a common theme everyone can see. Two is looking at institutional frameworks, looking at multilateralism, and how to better address those kind of things. So Yasek, otherwise known as uh, Dr. Doom and Blood and Guts, um, actually, you, and a lot of people don't realize this, but you've actually devoted a large portion of your career to peace. Um, stability through theories, applications, and practices. So, um, question to you now. What should the United States do versus what can the United States do? Well, I don't know what they should, but I can tell you what they can. <laughs> uh, uh, for me, leadership is not simply a, a word. It 
it's as if you're a wonderful leader in a small society, uh, Mrs. Merkel, and she wants to change Europe. Uh, her influence is extraordinarily limited, simply because she doesn't have the structural characteristics to impose her, or if you happen to be in Switzerland, not to pick on Germans. Uh, so the first thing you need to have, in my opinion, in order to think in terms of global leadership, is you need to have the capabilities to do so. That's why we always talk in terms of hierarchies. The second thing is you have to make some assumptions. Uh, the current assumption, the dominant assumption in international politics is a realist assumption. And that, say, is the one that I put in red here, which is confrontational and transactional, which is what our president does. And the reason I think he is not going to be successful, even though I agree with Pat that the one choice of asking the Europeans to pay is okay, uh, is because he's distancing us from people who are our friends. So you need to have a cooperative rationalist approach. And that is you have to take a look at how much do I get today for the status quo, and how much am I going to get tomorrow from challenging the existing status quo. And uh, there are leadership options. You can either try to maximize your relative gains, do the best I can for my country regardless of what, which is again Mr. Trump. Or you could say, I'm really interested in the general goal of societies, which is, for instance, what happened in, uh, after World War II in Italy when the Europeans started the European Union, which now the English are in moving out from. And we have to actually think about that. Why is it that the group that's benefiting from the Union is pulling out? And they are basically being sold the relative gains uh, portion, which is to a large degree as direct representation against theoretical structures. And that's why I don't find my colleagues like Mr. Kissinger very attractive. Now, uh, here is a structure of the international system. The international system is really very simple. There are very few very large countries. We make the assumption that the very large countries in general are satisfied. And the main reason you make that assumption is because they've imposed their norms, their values, their structures on the international system. And if you persuade a large portion of the international system to follow those rules and norms, you have a stable environment. If, on the other hand, the majority of the international system is challenging your norms and values, you end up in an unstable environment. So this is actually the formal representation of a power transition structure in which you have to have satisfaction. Satisfaction simply means, I like the rules. Not every single rule, but I will favor this rules. I will have some process by which I change it through institutions. And uh, therefore, I'm going to be cooperative. Or I am trying to reject the rules. And consequently, I'm going to go and uh, blow people up, okay. uh, which, which has really two options. And on the other side is how capable you are. You could be very dissatisfied, but you can't do much about it. Uh, so, We've shown empirically that when you're at parity, which some people call balance of power, it is the precondition for a major conflict. That's the case for World War I, that's the case for World War II, that's the case for the Napoleonic period. So most of the things that people tell us only count if you're really scared about dying and you're not willing to take a risk to change the rules. Think about it. When you are approaching equality, with something you dramatically dislike. That's when you challenge, because you think that you could change it. And that's exactly what's happening today between China and the United States, that they want to change the rules. Okay. The question is, do we adjust rules, or do we impose rules? So let me go through the history of this. Okay. Uh, in 1948, uh, this is approximately the size of capability, just structure, of the international system. The United States was dramatically larger, and we ended up with Europeans on our side. This is only the big countries. 
But if you add everybody else, this picture doesn't change at all. So this is not chess, this is tic-tac-toe. China was minimal, India was inconsequential, and Russia was not very large. But we called it balance of power. Why do we call it balance of power? Why not? Nobody counted. <laughs> <laughs> so notice what the United States did at that time. They imposed the Marshall Plan. Okay? Created un institutions in the UN which resemble West Western values. Supported European integration. Those are big things. Okay? But we failed to persuade both the USSR and China to join us. We call that the Cold War, communist versus, and we emphasize that. Okay, now we sort of are a little confused about socialism. Okay, and we ended up with a Korean War in that particular period. Then we went to 6280, okay. Notice that the satisfied group was again preponderant, okay. Uh, we supported the EU, uh, we supported NATO, ASEAN. Okay, what we failed to do is press for denuclearization. And the main reason we did is we didn't want to lose our, lose our advantage. That's why we didn't do it. We made a proposal, the Russians said, well, give it up. And I said, no, I'll give it up until I, after I test. It's sort of uh, test and verify, the Reagan notion. That's very interesting. Uh, if you don't have it, it's unlikely you have to test it. So we ended up with nuclear wind ups, we ended up with Vietnam, but those are little wars. Okay, so now we got all the way to 2020. Okay, uh, that's the collapse of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union today is a minor power, the size of, uh, well, I don't have them there, but it's exactly the size of England. And we don't fear the English. I don't understand why we fear the Russians. Okay. And they would become increasingly inconsequential. And they understood that and they shifted towards China. And the reason is we didn't accept them into NATO. We didn't accept them into the European Union. We promised but didn't. Okay. Why why we do that? Because we have a hang up on balance of power, which is actually nonsense. It's been nonsense throughout the Cold War. So we have today Crimea, which is probably the biggest crisis in the Russian system that is completely silent. And the main reason is Crimea can incorporate both China and Russia into a confrontation. Okay, so now we have to guess something about the future. The first thing is it is inevitable, short of a nuclear war, that China will be the dominant country in the Russian system whether Mr. Trump likes it or not. Our greatness is 1948. Thank you. But now we have the calling question. Can we keep our alliance with Europe and Japan? If we keep that combination, we will be larger than China. If we bring the Indians in, we're going to be preponderant. It will be very similar to the system you have been accustomed to. If that's not the case, okay, China and Russia and India will dominate the international system. But regardless of what happens, the whole structure is moving to Asia. And nuclear proliferation, we keep asking people not to have nuclear weapons, uh, and we keep picking on Iran for having it, but we don't pick on Israel for having it. Those are two small countries. You want to stabilize the system, you have to pick on both and say you can't have it. And the same thing for North Korea and potentially for Pakistan. The reason you can't disarm is because of Pakistan can emerge. Okay. It's, it's a simple logic. Okay, 240, 260, I'm almost done. Okay, China will dominate the system unless you wish them really badly which I don't. The question becomes, China and India could in effect dominate the international system by themselves. And they're both developing societies that have quorums against developed societies. It is now 
We are passing our, our time. In effect, we are wasting our time. The Trump administration has wasted time, and so has the previous administration, by concentrating on side issues in the Middle East, nothing personal. Okay? It doesn't make any difference if we resolve every possible issue in the Middle East, if we don't resolve differences among the major powers. Okay. And our theory suggests that if you are at parity and you have nuclear weapons and you have a big debate, I don't know, Taiwan, uh, China Sea, uh, a conflict over Japan, that's the condition that leads you to the same conditions that led to World War II. So, and I think I'm done, almost. Yes, I want you to take a look at why is it that Asia is going to dominate. The reason Asia will dominate is because their, po <coughs> their population is massively larger than that of the West, massively. So for all of you, or some of you, who believe the West can dominate, you need to now outproduce everybody in Asia of a scale of five to one. And if you believe you're five times better than my Asian colleagues, I wish you luck. Thank you. So every time I uh, you know, give one of Yasin's talks, I always forget I should have had that extra shot of espresso. Before the talk. Uh, but once again, I see more commonalities than divergence in everything I've heard of here. So, uh, Yasek, uh, you're talking about the sh shifting global tectonics, right? And, and I think um, it's actually directly connected to what Salama was saying and just looking at it from a tops down, bottoms up perspective, right? So, and, and I think Pat and Gene are saying you know, about human beings, about multilateralism, about leadership, how we have to be entrepreneurs. We have to go out and we have to create those spaces. Um, Pat, what you were saying is, People are creating those spaces, but how are they being implemented in these institutional frameworks in these changing environments? Uh, so actually, this is giving me a lot of hope instead of uh, you know looking at these disparate perspectives. Uh, one, I think you would all agree on, everyone said almost the exact same challenges uh, in the 21st century. And two, some of the ways that we actually go about it. So uh, Ernie, sir. I think uh, you know you've lit the fuse for the rocket ship to start taking off, right? Um, given some of the guidance from uh, our colleagues here, let me open it up to you and then anyone else uh, in the audience, uh, so we can start asking questions from our team. Ernie, uh, any? I, I thank you so much for your contributions today. I, I, I uh, listened attentively as you each pr provided your input. Your, your, uh, evaluation of the world at large kind of thing. And uh, I guess I come from a different era and haven't evolved as much as many of you have, perhaps. And that is, I'm still troubled by the fact that however well-intended we are in this country and however much we'd like to change the world and be cooperative and so forth, uh, it's, it's, not, it's probably not going to happen in our lifetimes. But, but yet again, is it something we should work on? Absolutely. You know, I just, I, I recall the different things that we initiated when I was with the Sheriff's Department, trying to bring communities together, trying to bring criminals to be more law-abiding. And sitting in classrooms here at CGU, we discussed it around here one day. You know, how, do you, how, how are we ever going to eliminate criminality? And people were raising their hand. I was like, what? You know, we, we, and that was what, 35 years ago plus? And still we have more or less criminality. We have more or less conflict in the world. We have new weaponry in the world, and we're still at conflict with each other. And I was just thinking, perhaps a, and the UN is a, the UN is a forum, and yet watch some of their sessions. I mean, they have people turning off their, their sound systems, and you know, nobody, nobody wants to listen to each other. And uh, I just wonder where we go from here. And I, I hope that this can be a catalyst for us to be a, a productive player, a 
productive university a focal point here of creating cooperation in many ways? Remember, we can invite uh, major players from other countries of the world yes. to come here and, uh, yes. continue, and conduct forums. Mm -hmm. then, uh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. We all do, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> Let me open it up to the audience. Uh, Tom. Uh, uh, Pat and Yase, uh, what do you all see in China's objectives uh, at this point, how that would influence whether we can get some cooperative solutions? Uh, how I would see China's objectives, I do not see uh, China as an imperial power. I think it is not within the culture. I would recommend uh, looking at some older books, Chuck Duran's uh, Politics of Assimilation and uh, the Kennedy book that got so much attention about the evolving world powers. The soundbite is that if the United States handles itself right, there can be a condominium in Asia involving rising China and much more rising India in the future. I think Gossick has that part of the story completely right, that these powers are, are rising, and China is, is also going to have to deal with India on its flank. So what, do, what does China want? China, I think, is not an imperial power. I think we can cooperate, but there are certain hot-button issues that because of cultural differences, and I'll, I'll mention one again right now, Taiwan is not well understood in this country. A middle ground position that does not look fearful and does not cower before China, but at the same time doesn't push independence, will lead to a gradual sort of customs union type of relationship that will not cause World War III. So as long as one does not turn China, if you will, into a terrifying monster that somehow has to be defeated and destroyed, there will not be a war between those countries. Well, uh, it is clear to me that uh, we need to find a way to cooperate with China, which is exactly what England did with the United States after a major war. Okay. And the question becomes, why is it that the English became friendly with us and failed to become friendly with the Germans. Uh, it isn't that everybody becomes friendly with everybody. Uh, it's clear that we have to make some adjustments towards China. It's clear that China has to make adjustments towards us. And we should start that conversation now, not demonize either side. We could understand their concerns about Taiwan. On the other hand, we could say you should internationalize the China Sea. Uh, to the degree that they play nationalistic games, it's very bad. I, for instance, argued that the bank that they created for Asia, we should have joined, not opposed. And I think we should have joined in the uh, China Road, or whatever it's called, yeah. okay, and become a, a partner from the other side. We, we did exactly that when R uh, Russia collapsed. We had a perfect opportunity to bring the Russians into the EU and NATO. But half of our faculty were Russian realists. And what do you believe about your opponent? That he's only taking an advantage of you and blah, 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 blah. And I had big debates on it. And we missed that opportunity. That was our opportunity. <coughs> there we were dominant. And that is stupid, okay, including Reagan and in Iceland, including Bush one in the expansion of NATO without bringing the Russians in. If we do the same thing to China, in, I believe, about 250, you're going to face a real possibility of World War III. Other questions, comments from our audience? Heather. Um, I was curious, uh, Dr. James, you said that one of the things that we ought to do is the term you used was activate dormant issues to seek advantage. And I, I'm i not an IR person, and I really had no idea what that meant. Could you say a little bit more about what dormant issues might be that we should activate to our advantage? Yes. One example, of course, was the sort of thing at Thanksgiving dinner or whatever where nobody wants to talk about uh, the relative who just won't turn their phone off or something like that, right? I just kind of made that up as an example. Trump was rude enough and obnoxious enough which more, if you will, genteel presidents on both sides of the aisle wouldn't do to say, you know, you people are cheapskates and you need to start paying your own share of things, and it wasn't done in a very elegant or pleasant way. Abeyances, in other words, dormant issues, the Allies can absolutely afford to spend. 
more than they're spending, period. Virtually every one of those countries up there is OECD and, and quite wealthy. Now coming back to Yasek's point, ironically, with a certain amount of smacking them around with sticks or offering carrots and getting them to spend more within the alliance, the United States actually delays its loss of ground because military spending on average is not as productive as civilian spending. There's controversy, I know about that, but on average there's a lot of dead weight waste in that. What's another issue that could be activated? Uh, I didn't mention it quite that way, but I think there's a huge amount of interest from China in striking a bigger deal than North Korea. North Korea historically is whatever people who look at the media would get a simplified version of it. It's a bratty child that the, the Chinese mom and dad will not sufficiently discipline to make the United States happy. Okay, that's, that's a limited way of looking at things. What about further denuclearization within Asia, in particular involving Japan? I think the United States loses nothing, and I think Japan would actually be relieved. And I also think it could include the Korean Peninsula, Taiwan, and Japan together, as in the United States not in a way that cowers, but in a way that recognizes the maturity of China. I use somewhat different language than, than others on the panel, but a mature China must now be given some degree of deference in its immediate abroad, because we can't stop that from happening anyway. If I had longer, I would talk about the uh, defense data on this subject. The United States absolutely cannot dominate the South China Sea, not forever. It's better to make a deal when the Chinese might be open to it. Other dormant issues, I'll cite another one. I'm not sure how realistic it is right now, but some type of, I, I'm not as ambitious as some others thinking that we could have a Palestinian-Israeli condominium on security issues, in particular nuclearization. But I'm really optimistic that the Palestinian Authority, the Israelis, possibly the Jordanians and others might be open to something that looks like the European coal and steel community from the 1950s, a weak, soft EU, not an EU. Those would be a few examples, Heather, uh, but I don't want to go on too long. And it is going on, by the way, yes. behind the scenes, mm -hmm. right now, mm -hmm. because of, if you watch, you know what Mr. Kushner said yesterday at the uh, Institute, Washington Institute, uh, the Saudis are coming in with big amount of funds to bring in what you can call the other donors in the region so that they can really help what uh, can be substantial um, derivative for the economy of building um, economic regional cooperation between the countries in the region and Israel. This is really a kind of a revisiting of the, the plan that was done when uh, Mr. Rabin was, was alive. And there was, in the region, in Egypt, what we described as a regional bank that was set up and was there for two years. And the links were with the Jordan and with the Palestinian West Bank and with Gaza. And Egypt was the center, which will be happening if we get into this solution where uh, the problem right now seems to be Gaza. It is not the West, you know, uh, Western Bank, but it is Gaza, and that's why I did mention this kind of the emerging uh, kind of non-state actors like Hezbollah and Hamas. So as we are here, things are happening in the region. And of course, it's not, that we are clear uh, about what Mr. Kushner is announcing because all the details are being worked with the United Nations, with the European Union, with the OECD. So it's not only the American partner, but more than that. So frankly, it is just like we are in the right moment. Well, it, it, it's critical to understand that you cannot treat one set of people A and another set of people B. In the Middle East, if you want to really establish some possibility of long-term peace and cooperation, you need to get rid of nuclear weapons. I know that people say, well, if Israel gives it nuclear weapons, well, uh, we can put umbrellas. But it is not feasible to treat Iran as a nuclear 
some kind of external unjustified country and at the same time support the build-up of nuclear weapons in Israel. That just is not, it's not feasible. It hasn't worked. It will not work. You can't sell it anywhere except in the United States. Uh, you can't even sell it in Europe. And we keep doing that, and we just simply talk, oh, these guys are bad, therefore they shouldn't have it, or for that matter, North Korea or, or somebody else. It isn't only your enemies. After all, the English have it, the French have it, okay? And uh, we say, oh, well, you know, those are our friends, so that's okay. We need to basically have consistent policies that allow the other side to also reduce the tensions they believe they face. To the degree we continue doing what we're doing now, which is really maximizing our self-interest, we are going to run in trouble because we're not that big anymore. A very quick follow-up, a statistical one, if I could, that it may surprise you when I say this, but I think the main reason so many peace deals, when we look back, have failed, not just in the Middle East, but other regions, is the lack of involvement of religious leaders. It's an incredibly important oversight, a disastrous one, back in 2000 when Clinton intervened. The stat is that overall, aside from the coastlines of the United States, Western Europe, and a few other enclaves, the world is actually becoming more religious, not less so. And those are the leaders who are respected. Yeah. And if I may add, if you look into the speeches that were at the Knesset in 1979, the two leaders, be it a Mr. Sadat, or at that time, of course, Mr. Um, you know, the Prime Minister of uh, Israel, they made their opening speeches and the end of the speeches by quotations from the uh, holy books. So indeed, in preparation for the peace talks and everything, we needed to involve what you describe as many young religious leaders from the three Abrahamic religions, and then we continued on that to get actually to the peace accords with Jordan, and that was when we started, frankly speaking, all the interfaith dialogue when the Grand Imam of Egypt came to the United States and met actually in many closed sessions that were not announced. I was there with him together with uh, Harvard, Yale, as well as NYU, which was chairman by the Rockefeller Foundation. I'm a Rockefeller scholar. So they contacted me, and I contacted the Grand Imam of Egypt, of course, with permission from our security and with the president's office. And they blessed it. And indeed, the Rockefellers were very adamant in, their, uh, in keeping everything done in perfection, and I mean perfection, for 15 days behind closed doors to reach mm -hmm. what we now know as sustainable peace between both Israel and Egypt, as well as Jordan and Israel. So um, unfortunately, we're running out of time, but I want to give Jean uh, last thoughts and comments. Well, I have a few thoughts that may depart a little bit. First of all, I think we have to rethink many of the institutions that we've taken for granted. The UN, for example. Uh, the UN was a wonderful idea at the time that it was conceptualized. But has it lived up to its promise? Has it, what do we, do we now not have to think about what other kinds of institutions are important and necessary. Right now, before any vote, forgive me, is taken at the UN, we can tell you what the vote's going to be. Not pretty much. Assembly. Well, pretty the much. The Security Council, but the yes, General Assembly are still in full control. OK. And another thing I would like to point out, in the connective era, one of the things that we can, that we predicted is that there would be shifting coalitions that there wouldn't be the large-scale coalitions of the past that, were, that stayed together and were expected to stay together and vote on issues, some of which were not important to certain members of the coalition. So that in a connective era, 
uh, smaller groups are going to break out and work on certain issues. And so it doesn't surprise me very much, frankly, to see that the European Union is, you know, teetering or tottering. I think we have to expect that, but we have to develop leaders who have a new understanding of the world and a new understanding of leadership. And picking leaders or grooming leaders as we have in the past is simply not going to cut it. Thank you, Jean. Thank you to our panelists.